Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show with Bill Arnold. As you can probably tell, I am not Bill Arnold. My name is Than Bennett, and I am sitting in for Bill today, actually sitting in for him all this week. And I will tell you, I am familiar with the Faith Radio family. I am always so honored to be able to spend some time with you all, to be with you and to have conversation, and ultimately to lift high the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm grateful that you're along for the conversation today. And I want to ask you a question right at the outset. And I want to ask you a question to sort of frame the way that you're thinking about the conversation that we are going to have together with my guest. It is Pastor Adam Griffin. And here's the question. I want to know who or what will have the greatest impact on what your kids believe and on what they determine to be truth. And I want you to think about that question. Our guest is going to speak into it a little bit, but it is a question that really sits at the core of my wife, Brooke, and I's reality right now. We are we are raising three kids. They're 15, 13, and 11. And we live in a world uh, where there are just an overwhelming amount of inputs. And I, I would venture a guess that probably Brooke and I are maybe on what I would call the conservative end of this of this spectrum. Our kids don't have social media, and we take some other precautions. And I'm sure many of you are you know, venturing through some of those same questions for yourselves. But no matter what you do, kids living in 2024 are just constantly interfacing with information and with with content and with a wide variety of ideas. And many of them are claiming to have a mantle of truth. And so my question for you today, which of that information and who among those many messengers is going to have the greatest impact on what my kids believe and on what your kids believe? and on what they hold to be true. So that's the question we're going to talk about. We're going to unpack it with our guest. He is Pastor Adam Griffin. Let me introduce him to you. Adam is the lead pastor of Eastside Community Church in Dallas, Texas. He previously served as an elder and a spiritual formation pastor at the Village Church. His wife is Chelsea, and they have three boys. I love these names. His three boys are Oscar, Gus, and Theodore. And particularly relevant to what we'll be talking about today, Pastor Adam is the author of a brand new book. It is called When Wrong Seems Right, a kid's Bible study on making good choices. So Pastor Adam Griffin, welcome to the afternoon show on Faith Radio. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you. And we were talking before the show and I was asking him what to call him. He said, just call me Adam. But I I think I'm going to go with Pastor Adam, if that's okay. I just like the way (laughs) that sounds. All right. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Pastor Adam and uh, let me start here. I want to dig into the content of your book. It's, it's so relevant to uh, actually my life right now. So you're, you're speaking to a felt need of mine and of ours, but, but I want to start about by asking you about your boys, since we're, since we're going to be talking about kids and and making wise, wise choices. I want to hear about your boys. Tell me about them. Tell me about what raising three boys looks like. And then Maybe tell me how Chelsea keeps all four of you. Yes, I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to lump you into that. How, how does Chelsea keep all of you in line? Well, uh, thanks for asking. I I delight to talk about my three boys. Like you said, it's Oscar, Gus, and Theodore. They are twelve, ten, and eight. So we're just a couple years behind you, but we're right in the wheelhouse for this resource that we're putting out. And our our kids are involved in sports. Our kids are all in school full-time. My wife works part-time as a labor and delivery nurse. So we are a very busy family in the sense that we have a very full life. But our highest priority is to see our kids come to know the Lord. So we have, of course, given our best energies towards uh, discipling our kids. And that's what, when I'm not pastoring Eastside, the church that I'm the pastor of, 
that's what Chelsea and I spend our time doing. We pastor our, our disciple, our own kids, and then we spend our free time, you know, recording our family discipleship podcast, writing about family discipleship. And that's what led to resources like this. We're not perfect parents by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly, Chelsea is the brilliant one who keeps me in line. I guarantee you'd rather talk to her than me, but she works the night shift. She's asleep right now. So unfortunately, you're getting me instead. But uh, man, I, our delight is in the Lord, and our hope is that in planting the seeds of the gospel and watering, watering them, that one day we would get to see the Lord grow some fruit in the lives of our own sons. We got to see our oldest come to Christ last year, and we're praying for the other two to see the same thing. And uh, so that's that's the Griffin family in a nutshell. I love that so much. You know, I, I tell my siblings a lot. I, we have we have four boys in our family, or we did growing up, and three girls. And you know, we are we we have this conversation a lot that parenting is the hardest job in the world. It's also the most most rewarding, but you don't really realize how. Um, at least in my case, how, how great your parents were until you're trying to walk through the same things uh, with true. your kids. So yeah, I pr- appreciate that. Let me. I'll tell you this, and I won't. I won't. To go down this rabbit trail too much, but I, I need to have a conversation with Chelsea about uh, her work at some point, labor and delivery nurse. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I are involved in foster care and actually caring for newborns right after birth. And so what mm. she does is, is close to our heart. So I, I love that. Um, let me do this, Adam. Let me, let me hear a little bit more about you before we get into the content of the book. We've heard about your family, but you're a pastor, right. you're an author, you're a Jesus follower. What else yes, should we know about you before we dig in? And here's, let me, let me land here because this is the question that I love to hear from Jesus followers. How was it that he drew you to his side? Tell, tell us about you and then tell us about that specifically. Well, yeah, you know, I grew up in a, in a home that certainly uh, was centered in Christ in all the ways you would hope for. My dad and my mom were both Christians. As far back as I could remember, I knew the name of Jesus and I knew the gospel and I had a certain kind of arrogance, honestly, around it. I thought I knew better than most. I thought I knew my Bible better than most. I attended church most of my more than most of my friends. I uh, developed a real sense of uh, superiority. But later in life, as I've followed Jesus for myself and in my 20s came to know him on a, a whole nother level where um, there wasn't any more kind of duplicity in me, which had been the reality for high school and college, where there was a Christian version of me at church and a Christian version of me with my Christian friends that was not always true of me. There was a facade and a veneer that had be peeled back. And as the Lord really grabbed a hold of my heart fully in my early 20s, he also led me into student ministry and he led me into pastoral ministry. And I taught public school for a few years and led kids to Christ there and, and through young life. And honestly, uh, when in my childhood, I think I, I developed a kind of superiority complex. As I got older, I kind of went the other way. And the Lord gave me a, a profound sense of, or in my sin, a profound sense of insecurity. Am I am I enough? Am I doing enough for the gospel? And God has always dragged me into, and I haven't always been ambitious enough to pursue opportunities to follow him. You know, the Lord has been so kind that he would not let me wander. And in many ways, he He chased me down and he sought me out and he pressed me into things, including pastoring and planting the church that I'm in right now, authoring the books that I've gotten to write, speaking on family discipleship. These are all things I would delight to do, but in a bit of a sinful lack of ambition and a deep-seated insecurity, I needed the Lord to kind of push me into it. And so uh, there's a million ways that that's the case, but that's a big part of my testimony is I delight to get to do this work, pastoring and writing and parenting, but much of it came in spite of me, not because of me. That's so good. You know, when I was uh, younger, about the same age, probably my early 20s, as you describe it, I would, uh, when I would sign off on letters or, or notes to friends, Adam, I would I would finish with a little phrase that I thought was was cute and pithy and was actually pushing people to, to Jesus. I would write, keep striving. Mm. And as I got older, I realized that that was really rooted in me, right? It was rooted mm. in a belief that I needed to do to be saved. And so uh, you know, the truth was I was saved in order that God can do things through me. So I, I love that. I appreciate you you sharing. Let's let's dig into the content of the book a little bit. I, I love the title, Ways That Seem Right. I'm, I'm sure that was drawn from pa- uh, Proverbs 14. I'll let you expand on that if you want to. But I'll right. just tell you this, as a as a parent, you've got my attention with just that 
that premise. We've talked about how parenting is a hard job, but it just, it feels to me, Pastor Adam, it's just, it's so hard to help our kids separate right from wrong in today's world. So just on a very macro level, speak, speak to that. Why this book yeah. and, and how does this book help with that? Well, yeah, Moody was putting together a Bible study series for kids that I was really excited about. For 8 to 12-year-olds, there's not a lot of resources for kids that age. And I, was, I wanted to select an Old Testament book. And my heart is for this topic. And so Proverbs made a ton of sense. And like you said, the title of the book, When Wrong Seems Right, came from the Proverbs, this uh, proverb that says, there's a way that it will seem right, but in the end, it leads to death. And every Christian parent can see that in the culture. This is a very confusing culture to raise kids in because we can tell them what the Bible says. And then there's a culture that comes along with a very loud voice, be it through music or TV or social media, and we'll tell our kids something that we say disagrees entirely with what we believe, but to our kids, it seems right. And so how do you help your family navigate where their heart tells them one thing and the Bible tells them another? Where God is saying, let me be king, sovereign, Lord of your life. And our heart is saying, no, I, I would rather be Lord of my life. And I would rather go the way of the world. And I think the Proverbs are an excellent opportunity, though in the past, they've often been used for behaviorism or moralism, just telling kids, don't do this, do do this. There's, there's such a wealth of wisdom and of grace and mercy for those who make mistakes uh, that it's it's a perfect place for me to address the culture, in my mind, for, for kids this age. I mean, Proverbs is both the place that warns and promises, but it's also a place that says, he who confesses and forsakes his sin will obtain mercy. It's one of the best synopsis of mercy and grace in the Bible. And so a lot of this uh, study is to teach kids how to study the Bible for themselves. It's also to help them distinguish and discern truth from not truth, right from wrong. And that is for this age group, being able to make a godly choice is critical for this group as they're starting to develop their own sense of independence and to own their faith for themselves for the first time, at least we hope. That's so good. We're going to go to break in just a moment, but just one follow-up question on that, Pastor Adam. I I, I think for for many parents, the struggle around a certain decision might be whether or not to allow our kids exposure or whether or not to take them out of that situation. And one of the things I love about Proverbs, one of the way things I love about the way that you apply it in this book is it's not, it's not always that question of in or out, right? We're supposed to be in the world, but not of it, but we're also supposed to leave a mark on the world. So say, say just a word, uh, if you would, about, yeah. I, I can see that thread uh, all the way through this book. So our kids having an impact on the world, not just sheltering them from it. Yeah. The way we talk about it on the family discipleship podcast that my wife and I do is in our family, we kind of have our things about which we are monastic or monkish and those other things that we are more like missionaries, mm -hmm. monks or missionaries. And so for some aspects of the world, we will be monks. In other words, we will withdraw from society in order to follow Jesus, which is the monastic way. We are going to retreat from that. There are some things that we don't want to expose our kids to at all, that we are not going to engage in at all because we follow Jesus. Then there are other aspects of the culture about which we will be missionaries, in which we will interact with the culture, pursue the culture, but in order to be a light in a dark place, never to excuse sin or say it can live alongside and coincide with our faith, but always as a missionary. And so helping our kids understand why our family's making decisions, either to be monastic or to be missional, is a really important aspect of what we do. And while we don't use those words with our kids, that is how we make our choices as a family in a culture that's going to teach them something very different than what their parents are. That's so wise. I love it. I'm going to use that with our family. I think of the fact that we're called a peculiar, a peculiar people, right? And sometimes right. we are going to withdraw from things from society. Sometimes we're supposed to flee altogether, and then sometimes we're supposed to have an impact. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to dig into some of the specific uh, themes that underride uh, this book. My guest is Pastor Adam Griffin. We are talking about his book, When Wrong Seems Right. And actually, if you are a parent or if you're maybe a grandparent or if you just have children in your life who you want to help guide in a godly direction, if you've got a question for Pastor Adam, you can text that in to 877-933-2484. It's 877-933-2484. We will get to some of those questions later in the broadcast. Again, I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold. This is The Afternoon Show. My guest is Pastor Adam Griffin, and we will be back with more after this.
Hi, this is Bill Arnold, host of the Afternoon Show. My friend and colleague, Susie Larson, will say that even when you feel discouraged, God is still there. He's still good. He cares about you and is in the business of fixing what is broken to make you whole. Experience his peace today. This month, thanks to our friends at Thomas Nelson, Faith Radio is giving away 100 copies of Susie Larson's new book, Waking Up to the Goodness of God, 40 Days Toward Healing and Wholeness. You can enter to win yours right now at MyFaithRadio.com. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. The book is When Wrong Seems Right, written by Pastor Adam Griffin. He's my guest. I'm Fan Bennett, sitting in for Bill Arnold this afternoon. So glad you are along for the conversation. Pastor Adam, I want to jump right back in, and I am sure this is a question you get a lot about uh, this book. I mean, if you're going to write a book about how to uh, determine right from wrong and how to help your kids navigate it, you're going to get the techn- uh, the, the question about technology, right? So h- how do we keep technology from becoming that dominant voice in our kid's life. And, you know, when, when I think about this, I, I, I actually think about it maybe a, a layer deeper. How do we, how do we keep technology from being the dominant arbiter of truth, right? How, how does that yeah. happen and, and how do you deal with it in this book? Well, you know, technology, we can all say is, is an amoral thing, right? It's not uh, definitely sinful. It's not definitely evil, but the way that it is used, especially for young people, be it in social media or in the kind of movies, or you just call it content, music, movies, TV, there's a lot of ways by which technology becomes the means that uh, something that is not godly gets into our kid's heart. One of the proverbs we talk about in the book is, can a man hold a flame close to his chest and not be burned? Which is such a brilliant way of saying, can you really hold something against you that would damage you and think you're going to walk away and say it was victimless? And in that, in that part of the book, we try to have an age appropriate conversation about pornography, about images, about content that might uh, be even searching for your kids to click on it, to see it, to hear it, to understand it. And so we talk about how that proverb teaches us that wisdom would say, you cannot hold something that would damage you, look at something that would damage you and say, no, it's not a big deal. It doesn't really hurt me or it doesn't really affect me. You can't watch violence or sensuality and expect to walk away unscathed is basically what the proverb is saying. And so we lean into that in an age appropriate way. We have questions about that. We have um, a discussion about that, cross references for that, but that is the root of the issue. It's not necessarily technology. It's evil. And how does evil use technology as a means? But also the lie our culture believes is that it's it's victimless. It's not destructive. If anything, there's a, a right and a liberation to enjoy the kind of violence in video games, violence in movies, sensuality in either or sensuality on the internet. And that's certainly something I want to protect my kids from entirely, if I'm able. Yeah, no doubt. And one of the conversations that I know we have with our kids a lot, it sounds like you're, you're, you're talking along the same lines is, is how to steward it, right? I mean, everything is supposed to be redeemed for the, for the glory of God, for the elevation of his name, for the amplification of his fame. So how do our kids uh, steward technology or, or anything else? Let me, let me ask you this, because uh, I want to get into some of the themes. I know we can't get into the individual lessons, there are 40 lessons over eight weeks in the book, but I maybe say a word if you could about how this book is designed to be used by parents. So it's it's broken down into conversation starters and journal entry slots, uh, but these, right. are, these are hard conversations for parents to lead their kids in. So talk a little bit just about the tactics of this book. How, how do you envision a parent using it with their kids? Well, the, by design, I think it could be used in a couple different ways. If you have a kid that you're ready to see start to buy, re, study the Bible for themselves, it's certainly designed with that in mind. You could hand it to your kid and say, I want you to start to work your way through this. And they would learn how to use cross-references, their concordance in order to answer their own questions, in order to create their own questions, in order to see the biblical story, how it connects. But it can also be something that parents do alongside their kids. So 
Every lesson starts with a little illustration after a proverb, and then there is a question that I always use to frame the family in the best possible light. So if it's a question about if a, if it's a proverb about integrity, it might ask a question like, when is a time that you saw your parents make a hard choice, but you knew it was the right one? They're always it's always painting their parents in a positive light, hoping that what comes from the study is also the building of their family. And then there's a cross-reference to teach these kids that there's a a line that goes through the whole scripture, that scripture is used to interpret scripture, that the story is consistent throughout. So we go from a proverb always to something in the New Testament, be it an epistle or something Christ said in one of the gospels, in order to help them make those connections. Because again, you know this, Than that what we're trying to do with this age group is teach them to be discerning and to distinguish. And one of the ways to reach that cognitive domain for kids to develop that kind of intellectual muscle is to give them opportunities to take two different things and compare them, contrast them, to distinguish between them. And while they're doing that in the scriptures, in the study, what we want to do is uh, develop their ability to do that in the culture, to be able to tell what is true and what is not. And certainly that can be something that parents work with their kid alongside them, but it's also designed for that kid to learn to study the Bible on their own, if you believe their kid's ready for that. And I think, honestly, we typically lower the bar for our kids that are 8 to 12. They can do more than we think they can. You said 8 to 12. Is that the, that's the target range for this? Yes, sir. So there's a, you know, a slew of resources for little kids. There's a lot of kids' mm-hmm. Bibles and kids' you know, albums, and there's a lot of stuff for high school. But what Moody is trying to do with this series is reach where I think there's a huge void which is these kind of not quite teenagers, but not little kids anymore, age eight to 12 year olds that are ready to study. Certainly if you're older than that, or if you're new to the faith, if you can be at any age, this will be helpful to anybody. But that was the idea. That was the hope that we would create some resources where there aren't many already to help these kids study the Bible. Well, and just by way of encouragement, I would I would tell you, you know, my kids are 11, 13, and 15, and, and I, I will tell you, and have, you know this, but once you get out of that uh, age group, and I think 12 is probably about the right number, once you get out of that age group, if you haven't laid a foundation for a lot of these conversations, it becomes difficult to do so. So I, I love that. I also love, and maybe say a word if you would on this, I love how both your writing and then all of the entry, so much of it is question form. So it's, it doesn't feel preachy to me. It feels like it's an invitation to to think through the content. I, I assume that was by design as well. Absolutely. Again, we're trying to challenge kids to think because what happens is when something seems right and you don't think, then you just end up trusting your gut or trusting your heart. And that will, what the proverb says, lead to death. And so we want to train kids to think and to be discerning, to go, what has the Lord said, even if what my heart wants says something different? And you know this, like a, for a kid especially, to steal something and get away with it feels good. To mm. lie and get away with it feels good. And that wouldn't happen unless our heart delighted in things that it shouldn't. And so you could go down the list, be it coveting or taking or adultery. There are things that a sin pleases the human heart. So if we don't think, if we aren't breaking out of that by asking some questions to get kids to interact with that, then we just go with our natural instinct. And of course, the heart is deceitful above all things and helplessly sick. What we need is the grace and mercy of God to change our hearts. Hmm. The book is When Wrong Seems Right. Adam Griffin is my guest. If you have a question for Pastor Adam, if you want to ask him about a particularly challenging topic that you, uh, a conversation that you need to have with your kids and how he might navigate that, you can text that question to 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. We're going to have a chance to uh, read some of those questions and let Pastor Adam respond. We're also going to have Pastor Adam pray over our kids. Uh, Pastor Adam, I want to ask you about a couple of these themes. You open uh, the book with the theme of wisdom. And just to, to kind of give, uh, to paint this picture again, th- these, these themes last for a week. So each theme has, has five lessons underneath them. We won't unpack each one of them, but you open with wisdom. Why? I, I suspect I know the answer, but why do you start with wisdom? Sure, of course. You know, if you're going to study the Proverbs and you want kids to understand not only the genre, but the intention of what God has written there, then you need to start with understanding what is wisdom, what is uh, knowing the way to live. We even start with kind of the the title chapter, the title lesson. What does it mean that some things are going to seem right, but in the end, they're actually wrong? And the knowing the difference, that's what we would call 
wisdom. It's not just the ability to tell the difference, it's the ability to make the choice that would lead us in the path of righteousness, uh, that would raise up the kid, and when he grows old, he'll not part from it, to head that direction. But it's also to know what to refuse, what to avoid, what to run from, and what to interact with and how. And so wisdom, of course, is the first lesson in the Proverbs in many ways. It's it's what it says is the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. So it's understanding that God knows better than I do. And so that's also where we start our study. And we offer, you know, we kind of break it up by these, these different uh, sections. But if five a week is too many for a kid or not enough, they, they work very well to go at any speed any reader is able to process through this work. Our oldest son is Jude. He's he's 15, and and Pastor Adam, this is one of the conversations I have with him a lot, and it is it's a conversation of the goal in walking alongside you is that you would be able to make these decisions uh, when I'm not there. However, that's very different than making those decisions on your own. And to me, what I hear you saying, and it's very similar to the conversation I have with Jude, it's it's to instill uh, a reminder of, of the, the the principles of the Holy Spirit, but not just the principles, not even just the truth of God's Word. It's a reminder that the Holy Spirit lives inside of Jude and can help him make those decisions as we go along. Is that is that consistent? Amen. Yeah. So that's what's difficult is for somebody who doesn't isn't indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then we can assume that a lot of our desires are just tainted by sin. But the great thing is the person who's following Jesus gets to go, even some of my desires are redeemed. I want to mm-hmm. follow God. And so I wouldn't say the heart is always or that following God will always be miserable. Like that's not what we're that's not what we're trying to tell kids. I'm trying to say that in following Jesus, not only is there a better life, but it also, if you seek first his kingdom, in other words, if what you want more than anything is him, you will get the desires of your heart and it will be a delight to you. Hmm. So good. You know, I we're gonna take a little break here, but I I think one of those um one of those lessons is helped by by looking around our world and realizing how many people uh, are 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 missing what they're searching for. They're they're longing yeah. for something that they have not yet found, and realizing that that taking a different path than what is around us uh, might not be such a bad option. So after the break, I want to get into the next couple of segments. I want to kind of group them together so you can be thinking about this. The next two uh, themes are virtues and vices. So let's take those together. What's right? What's wrong? Let's unpack it. My guest is Pastor Adam Griffin. The book is When Wrong Seems Right. I am Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold today on Faith Radio, and we have much more with Pastor Adam Griffin after this. How do our kids tell the difference between what's right and what is wrong? And then what do they do with that information? That is the uh, the gist of the conversation that we're having with my guest, Pastor Adam Griffin. I am Fan Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold today. Pastor Adam, I want to jump right back in. We've been walking through the various themes of your book. Each theme covers an entire week, so five days. As you said, you can extend that, of course. There's uh, no magic application of getting through each theme in a week. But the second two themes in the book... Uh, obviously, they go together. They're, they're the themes that the book is named after. It is uh, virtues, what is right, and then week three, vices, what is wrong. Take take those together, if you would. And, and you have to know what's right in order to know what's wrong. But those two things go together, don't they? Yes, sir. So sometimes a vice and a virtue are opposite sides of the same coin, like patience and impatience. And so we're not talking about the the same topic twice necessarily. We're just because it's only 40 lessons. We're doing five on some particular virtues that you would see in the scripture, something like self-control. And so self-control is a virtue. It's a it's a fruit of the spirit. The proverb also talks about self-control as it gives a metaphor for that, like a city without walls. And so we talk about what is a city without walls. It's like a driving without a seatbelt, riding a bike without a helmet would be a more eight to 12 year old metaphor for the same thing that a person without self-control, which is a virtue, is in danger. And so we kind of walk through that. And then we also spend five lessons on vices that are in the the proverb. So we might do one on how fury is not your friend. And it talks about how giving in, the proverbs talk about how giving into your venting or raging is actually going to work against you. 
And so in these two lessons, they're not necessarily directly juxtaposed, but we do spend a week thinking about these are things the Lord has called us to, and then a week thinking about these are things the Lord has called us away from. And we tried to choose Proverbs that are directly related to what is the experience of an 8 to 12-year-old with vices and virtues? What are their struggles? What are their challenges? And then what can they be commended for? Before we move to the next one, I've got to ask you about day three in week three. And and I, I, I will say this right up front, Pastor Adam, this is because this is one that, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm full grown, but I still deal with this. This is, this is a constant day three is grumble, grumble, grumble. Give me, give me a, give me a look into that lesson. What's that one look like? Well, can you, re- can you read the proverb for us? Remind me the actual verse. Uh, let me hold on. I got to I got to scroll to that. But the the, oh, okay. the day gotcha. is grumble, grumble, grumble. I will get to that. If you could start there, I will find it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So of course we see that in the people of Israel in the story of Exodus as well. But it is absolutely something that kids struggle with. We we often talk with parents about this as well when we talk about discipleship. That grumbling is something that parents have a lot of uh, allowable hypocrisy around. In fact, you will see parents, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Dan, you'll be around parents who complain about how much their kids whine. You know, we will uh, grumble about how much our kids complain. And in that, we are actually demonstrating the same kind of thing that we're asking them to stop. Similar, we will be impatient with them, and so we demand for them to be patient. And what we address with it in this lesson on grumble, 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 is that kids' tendency is to look at their life and be dissatisfied and discontent in a way that is not holy. And so what we want, what God calls us to, is actually something better, which is contentment. You know, every kid Mm -hmm. has these experiences where they don't want to uh, receive what they've been given or where they're dissatisfied with it. And what uh, the New Testament calls us to is a beautiful contentment, knowing that even if I don't have what I want, I am okay. And even if I have more than I need, then I am okay enough to be generous with it. So the Proverbs with the lesson is Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Pastor Adam, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> this, this, this can be for parents too, right? Oh, yeah. You know, what's so funny is that's a great example of a proverb that we probably, you, most parents, if you heard somebody say to their kid, you are being a fool, it would sound kind of harsh, but Proverbs does not pull punches saying, if you're going to give full vent to what bothers you, you're going to sit here and complain. That is foolish. It's wisdom to say, oh, why would I complain about this? And of mm-hmm. course, we don't want just just silence. We actually want a heart condition that is contentment. I love it. We've got some texts coming in. I'm going to get to some of them in just a moment. But if you have a question for Pastor Adam, uh, the number to text those questions into is 877-933-2484, 877-933-2484. Let me, uh, let me ask you this. Week four, truth. What is true? And I, I, I would... I don't know. I think I would open the conversation this way. I am going through a a class that uh, with, with our with our oldest two that talks about worldviews and the different worldviews yeah. that people hold, and there is a there's a dominant thought in our world today, Pastor Adam, that 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 truth is a construct, right? That it's something that's right. abstract. How do you get um, to the to the to the truth, capital T, that uh, truth is absolute? How do you how do you get to that? Well, since uh, the Proverbs and the Scripture as a whole talk about truth is uh, like what God has said is absolutely true, we give kids the confidence to be able to say, if if you're looking for something to stand on, a firm foundation, you can find it in God's Word. And of course, we would say, just like Christ did, anything else you build your life upon is like sand. When the storm comes, like we believe you can build these homes, but when the storm comes, only one will be left standing. So if you build your house on what the world would call truth, that is actually some kind of relativistic uh, following your own heart's desire, you will find that it does not stand up to suffering. It does not stand up to the problem of evil. It does not stand up to our most difficult circumstances. The only thing that will stand up and be eternal is the Word of God. And so I, this whole uh, Bible study is built around that premise, that there are so many things that are not true. So we have to help our kids see in this desert of lies and deception, there is an oasis of truth, but is only found in Christ and his word. 
I love that part of your answer was to give them the confidence. And I, I, I think that flows right into the next theme, which is identity. Who am I? And, uh, you know, Pastor Adam, when we, when we believe things that aren't true, when we believe things that uh, uh, we're, we're not put in us by our creator, it leads us to an identity crisis, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. And so much of what this age group is dealing with is a crisis of answering the question, who am I? And who I am, who am I in relation to other people? And of course, that leads to a lot of body image issues. That leads to a lot of what we see on social media, which is the pervasive bullying and picking apart and name calling. And uh, for this uh, group of people who are not mature enough uh, to able to be able to rationalize their way through it, but their emotions are so profound and so real, it creates a really dangerous formula a combination of strong emotions without a very rational rational mind. And so, of course, the Proverbs, again, is that firm footing for them to be able to tell them, this is who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And since we have a truth here, you can promise that the one who created you gets to tell you who you are, what you were made for. And that is somewhere we can uh, stay rooted. Each of our kids was fearfully and wonderfully made. They don't look alike. They don't act alike. They are not the same, and that is by design. Our God put in each one of them uh, unique characteristics for a reason. I love uh, that you're aiming to give them confidence to walk in that identity. I want to uh, take a question from a listener now. Uh, this listener writes in and she says, does the book address fruits of the Spirit due to faith versus good works on your own? That's a great question. We don't do a lot of distinguishing for kids. Are you a believer or are you not? And of course, we believe that fruit of the Spirit is something that comes from walking with God because you have a salvific faith. At the same time, it's not based in behaviorism that just says, hey, these are good things to do that God wants you to do, and they are devoid of your connection with Christ. No, we believe that abiding with Christ leads to these things. But wisdom can be broadly applied in a way that if your kid has still not come to Christ, this is still something that is wisdom for them, we believe. It's it's prescriptive, it's helpful, but it's even more uh, applicable to the kid who is actually following Jesus. So the fruit of the Spirit that we would reserve for someone who's walking with the Spirit, indwelled by the Spirit, is very similar to just what it looks like to have um, and even a godless version of patience. But in this book, what my hope is, is that in helping kids dive into the word, whether they're following Christ yet or not, they will find him there. And it's part of the way that God will draw them to themselves, to himself. And if they are already following Jesus, then they will see the fruit of the spirit uh, worked out as they get drawn closer to him. You said a moment ago that the book uh, talks about who our kids are in relation to other people, and that's really the next theme, which is relationships. And right. actually, a text message came in. I, it, it's, it's a bit long to read the whole thing, but basically the question is, it's a, it's a grandmother of seven grandchildren who uh, her kids are facing peer pressure in schools related to identity and sexuality and um, uh, various fads of our culture. H how... How would you instruct, or not instruct, how would you encourage parents to walk your kids through having relationship with people who uh, maybe don't have a secure identity in their Savior and actually offering that to them? Is that How deep into that do you get? Well, you know, it's one of the overt things that the Proverbs talks about several times. The Proverbs are written from the perspective of father and mother saying, hey, son, do not depart from our wisdom. And on several occasions, it talks about do not go the way of these people and do not become friends with these kind of people. And it's giving wisdom and advice about being wise in those relationships, that there's going to be a difference between you and others. Of course, Christ picks, the, picks this up in a very interesting and profound way when he talks about the fact that he is not liked by the world. He uses the word, I am hated by the world. And if you follow me, do not be surprised if they hate you too, because they hated me first. This might be the most important lesson for the generation of grandkids and kids that we have right now, which is that following Jesus will not make you cool. It will actually have a social cost. And so there's a there's kind of a pervasive deception that churches have walked in for a long time, for the last generation, where we try to sell Christ almost like it is cool to follow Jesus and it is cool to be a Christian. Well, that is not going to be true for this generation. So we're not trying to convince them that it's the coolest thing to do. We want to convince them that what Christ said is true, that following him is the only way to salvation, and mm -hmm. it will lead to you possibly being despised. I'll give you a, an analogy, a, a simple one. Where I live in the city of Dallas, 
there are a lot of people that are fans of the Dallas Cowboys. Where my family, we are not fans of the Dallas Cowboys. We actually root for a very different football franchise that recently defeated the Dallas Cowboys. And so for my <laughs> for my kids to wear their Packer gear to school you know, makes them seem very strange and despised. And it, it leads to a lot of, you know, potential vitriol and and bullying. But it would take it takes some guts. It takes some courage to say, I don't root for the same team you do. And in a similar fashion, and kind of, I, I'm proud of my kids for this. I think we need to develop in our kids that that take heart mentality because Christ has overcome the world. That, and part of that taking heart will look like being prepared to be different, even to be hated for what we believe. And so that takes having overt conversation with our kids saying, hey, just so you know, there's a lot of people that not only don't believe what we believe, they will not like you because of what we believe. And there's a way that's going to seem right to the world. And we're going to seem wrong, but we trust Christ because this is what he has said is true. And that takes some pervasive courage, some regular and consistent discipleship. It's not a one-talk solution to say, yeah, I mentioned that to my kids once. It's discipleship. It's going to be demonstrating demonstrating it for them, and it's going to be um, leading them in it regularly. Pastor Adam, we've got to go to a break, and I promise you it is not because you're a Packer fan and I'm a Bears fan. I promise you it's just the show clock, okay? I will pray for you over the break that you will see the light and you will come to the Chicago Bears. No, my, my guest is Pastor Adam Griffin. I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold. We will have more uh, conversation from his book, When Wrong Seems Right, and we will do that right after this break. When you sponsor a child in need, you change their life. Your child learns that God loves them more than they can imagine and that he has special plans for their life. Your child gets help with school and is taught leadership, life skills, and how to overcome poverty and succeed. Your child gets nutritious food and vital medical care that often saves lives. You might not be able to change the world, but for one child, you can change theirs. Meet the kids. Find your child at MyFaithRadio.com. Dot com. This is the Afternoon Show with Bill Arnold. I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill today. My guest is Pastor Adam Griffin. His book is When Wrong Seems Right. Uh, Pastor Griffin, I want to give you a chance to, to pray for our kids. There is uh, no greater job, no greater uh, mantle of authority than being a parent. So I'm grateful for this resource that you have put in the hands of parents. I encourage everyone to uh, check it out. But I want to talk about the last two themes before we pray over our kids. The uh, the theme of week seven, struggles. What about sin? And yeah. I think probably every parent, know, you know, this is this is tough. All of us make mistakes. How do we lead our kids in conversations about sin? Yeah, well, one of the ways, I like the way you said that. How do we lead in it? Uh, the good thing is um, we are not trying to raise perfect kids. We're raising imperfect kids that follow a perfect God. And while we want to always point them towards perfection, we understand they're going to make mistakes. And so we demonstrate to them the same thing. We are not perfect parents. So we will demonstrate repentance when and wherever we can. We will own everything we can. And hopefully in that modeling factor of discipling them, we will start to see them be able to flex the same muscle. And sometimes we'll backslide, we'll make some progress and then fall back. Sometimes we won't even have, you know, one of the Proverbs says, there's people that think they are clean, but they are filthy. We won't even be able to tell sometimes of our sin until someone points it out or addresses it in us. And the same will be true of our kids. They're going to, again, think that everything is okay. And then find out that when compared with Christ, everything might need to change. And so we're going to gently uh, pursue addressing sin in a heart to restore them. And the proverb says that he who forsakes and confesses his sin will obtain mercy. And while it is talking about how God is merciful, the truth is that parents can be just, or not just as merciful, but parents are called to be likewise merciful, to forgive the same way they have been forgiven. You know, one of the things that has been instructive for Brooke and for me, and this this is you know, a lot of this probably takes place beyond the age group, uh, the age demographic that you're targeting, eight to twelve. But is growing in that relationship with our kids of 
of being open about failures. Obviously, you got to be careful. It's got to be age appropriate. You got to be um, stewarding their minds and their hearts as well. But but allowing them to see that the imperfection in me, Pastor Adam, needs redemption from Christ just as much as as the imperfections in them. Uh, so I, I think that that's important. Week eight is uh, perseverance. Yeah. You close with perseverance. I think that's probably appropriate, but talk us through perseverance. Yes, sir. Well, perseverance to me is such an important aspect of the Proverbs and of the scripture in general. I think we are called as a people to endure. Both that means the promise that there will be suffering for following Christ, some of it socially, well, like we've already talked about on the show, but there may just be suffering in general from the result of our own sin or living in a sinful world or the result of somebody else's sin. So the call to persevere is to not give up easy on that which is worth pursuing. So in following Jesus, we do what he's called us to do. And our confidence comes from knowing that he will never leave us or forsake us. That's where our strength lies. You know, Christ said that you come to me when you're weary and I will give you strength. He says the youth will not grow weary, but they'll rise up on wings like eagles. That's what I want for our kids. That's what I want as well, that there is a good way to go. And and we're not just talking about behavior. There's a path, a, a way to go that I do not want to grow tired of pursuing. And so there's uh, even uh, if... Uh, one of the things I, I like to do for parents is reframe the word patience. Oftentimes as parents, we use the word patience to mean to wait quietly and kindly. But patience, or what can often be translated as well, forbearance, is to keep going, to not give up, to endure. And that is both a fruit of the Spirit and something that wisely God has called us to, to endure and keep going, not give up easy. And that's what I want for our kids in their pursuit of Christ. Amen and amen. And to that end, I would uh, I would just love. Well, first, I would just thank you for writing this. Thank you for uh, stewarding the call to uh, invest in. I would say first in parents and giving us tools to to, to lead our children. But uh, we've got about five minutes left in the broadcast, and I would just love it if you would take a couple of minutes to. Uh, pray over our kids, to pray for us as parents as we as we lead our kids. Um, there is there's nothing quite as uh, sobering as the responsibility of leading the next generation. But I would just say there's nothing as exciting either, right? There's nothing as exhilarating as as yeah. the potential that our children have. And so would you just lead us out, pray for our kids, pray for our parents, and that this book would have the impact that you've described over over these last few minutes? Yes, I'd be honored. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I pray even right now you would hear us. I know that there are listeners right now who are in very difficult seasons of parenting. They're facing a a version of rebellion in their own home, maybe even thinking about a prodigal child or grandchild who has ran from you, even with the knowledge of you, has determined they want nothing to do with you. God, I pray for those hearts. You say where broken hearts exist, you will be near. And so, God, we pray that right now you are near to the brokenhearted. There's no one we typically love more than our own children. And so, God, our hearts break when they don't follow you. So, God, help us in those circumstances and encourage us. Give us that that spirit, that energy to persevere in what is good, right, and faithful. And then, God, for those kids that you've afforded us to disciple, that are we are still shaping and sculpting and living under our own roofs. God, help us be faithful to do the work you've called us to do in a way that honors your name. And I pray, God, that the seeds we plant and the way that we water them would lead to fruit. Uh, I think of what you said in Matthew 13, that there was a tree that bore no fruit and it was worthy of nothing to be cut down But then somebody intervened and said, let's give it grace. Let's give it another chance. God, I pray for those families right now that maybe have not been bearing fruit. Things have not been going well, or maybe they've just been uh, toiling for a long time and haven't seen any fruit yet. God, I pray for grace and mercy to keep trying. And I pray in the, in the efforts and the endurance that God, you would reward that with fruit, that we would see kids come to know you and follow you. We would see them grow in their knowledge of you. And then we'd even see another generation come to lead others to follow you. God, you have been so gracious to introduce so many parents to you, to give us churches that support us. I pray for the churches represented by this broadcast. God, help us. Help our pastors and our ministers, help our our children's ministers and youth ministers. God, help build up a community of people who are going to come alongside us to help raise these kids to know you. And then, Lord, I pray that you draw them to yourself. Uh, the, your, your son is the way, the truth, and the life. It's in his name that we're praying these things, and it's for his glory that we're efforting these things. So God, we pray that Jesus Christ is made much of in our parenting for the sake of the gospel you called us to dedicate our lives to. Lord, we love you. 
and let this all be driven by that love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, I thank you for Pastor Adam. I thank you for his faithful work in compiling this resource. I just ask that you would uh, bless him for his efforts. And God, may you multiply the fruit from this effort. We will give you the glory on the other side. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Adam, Mm -hmm. I am so grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the conversation. A text message just came in. Thank you for talking about imperfections and forgiveness. It is very encouraging. I agree. We've only got about 30 seconds left in the broadcast, but where can people learn more about you and where can they buy the book? Yeah, the easiest place to learn more about me or our ministry is to go to familydiscipleship.com, and that will give you access to all the books we've written, our blog, and our podcast. And so familydiscipleship.com is the easiest place. You can also find When Wrong when Wrong Seems Right on Moody Publishers or on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy books. Brother, I am grateful for your time. Thank you for being here. I'm even going to overlook the fact that you're a Packer fan, okay? I, I, I still enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> Well, thank you for your grace and mercy today for my <laughs> own and- uh, sports fellowship. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Adam. Look forward to the next conversation. It's Adam Griffin. The book is When Wrong Seems Right. And hour two of the afternoon show with Bill Arnold is just ahead. I'm filling in for Bill this afternoon. I am Than Bennett, and we will be back with more right after this. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.